Okay, hi everyone. I think that we are going to get started now. So just for your information, we will be recording this webinar. Um, so please keep your cameras off and your microphones muted uh, for the duration of the presentation. So, hi, my name, whoa, what just happened to my computer? Um, my name is Michelle and I am the host of today's webinar. I am from Iridium Tutoring. And this is our college list webinar, which will be about um, choosing colleges and kind of creating a college list. So without further ado, I will be introducing our speakers. So beginning with our speaker from Iridium Tutoring, Han Chao. All right, welcome everyone. So, um, you know, I'm here as part of Iridium, but I'm also from BU. Um, and Iridium is a nonprofit organization uh, located in Boston, uh, but actually throughout Massachusetts. And we have tutors from all over. Um, and we just provide uh, free high school tutoring or tutoring for anyone really um, that need it. Yeah, and then if you want to introduce yourself as well. Oh, sure. Yeah. So my name is Han Chao. Um, I'm actually a first year dental school student at Boston University Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine. I did my undergrad at BU as well. I graduated Sargent College in 2020 um, and also did a master's program uh, during the pandemic. Great. Thanks. And next up, we have uh, members of Pi5 from MIT. Hi, I'm Alexis. I'm one of the members of Pi5, which is a sorority at MIT. And the reason that me, myself, and Jimmy were both in high five at MIT, and the reason we're here today is because one of our big things in our story is philanthropy. And so we like to just volunteer our time to help kids like you, hopefully give you a sense of what applying college is like and make it a little, little less scary. And so a little more about myself, I'm a 24, so I'm a print sophomore in college, and I'm studying electrical engineering and computer science with a minor in finance. Yes, hello. My name is Jimin. I am also from Pi Phi at MIT, a sophomore. My major is electrical engineering and computer science, and hopefully a double major in mathematics as well. I'm excited to talk with you guys today. Yeah, thanks so much. And last but not least, um, people from the BU Community Service Center. Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Ramon. I am from the BU Community Service Center. I am a sophomore majoring in biology, uh, currently on a pre-medical track. And basically what the Community Service Center or the CSC is, is an organization that wants to provide the Boston University community with opportunities to address and improve the critical concerns of Greater Boston and just serve Greater Boston in a meaningful and mutually beneficial way, you know, as um, current, since we're staying in on campus in the Boston area, it would be beneficial to us to help, to us and to the community to help out. Hi, my name is Giselle. Um, I'm currently a senior at Boston University who will be graduating later this May. And um, I am volunteering through the Community Service Center. Um, volunteering is one of the core principles um, we hold near and dear to our hearts as B students. So we're here to represent. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. So um, just before we begin, we also have a previous webinar about college applications available on our YouTube channel, Iridium Tutoring, um, featuring students from a variety of different schools, such as BU, I believe Northeastern, um, Carnegie Mellon and others. So if you're interested in that, you can find that on our YouTube channel. So an outline of what we will be doing today, we will be starting with this presentation um, and our speakers will be talking about different factors that go into choosing a college. And those factors will include things like size, extracurriculars, research opportunities, and food, as well as much, much more. And then our speakers will be speaking about their own personal experience choosing their college. And then last but not least, we will have a Q&A session where you will be able to ask questions to our speakers. So starting off with size, which will be with Giselle. Um, hi. So when you, so I'm gonna start off 
by saying um, I went to a small public high school. So um, one of the important things to me was um, making sure that I went to a university in which the class size, I felt that professors would be able to dedicate time and I would have those meaningful interactions with faculty, staff, and my classmates. Um, coming from a smaller high school, I knew that as much as BU is very large, we have a large student body. Um, our, the way our classes are structured, um, there is always sort of a discussion section or like a lab section where there are smaller subset of students and you can sort of collaborate with your peers and sort of get the better understanding you need from the smaller setting. Um, so that was really important to me when deciding my colleges. Um, I looked at student to faculty ratio. That was important to me. Um, I made sure to find out how the classes were structured. And, um, you know, I, from New York City, so I, you know, going to a small high school, I wanted to sort of branch out. So I felt like my university gave me that big pond, but sort of like, the way my classes are structured, it's more like a fishbowl. So that was something that was important to me. Um, definitely something you should look into and sort of reflect on the classroom setting you feel you would thrive the most in with regards to size. Great, thank you so much. And next up, majors and programs. So Jimin, you'll start off. Yes, so coming to MIT, I realized that there's a lot of interdisciplinary opportunities, like our majors are numbered. So course six are mostly computer science majors and there are course 6-1, 6-2 and on and on. And they just represent how computer science can be combined with different types of engineering. Also biology, we have majors that are computer science and data science and economics. So there's a lot of interdisciplinary opportunities available for us in terms of major and also double majoring or minoring. So that was an important aspect I considered when deciding on my college. And I'm sure like that is the same for other colleges where you need to look up different majors or programs available in order for you to know if that's what you really want to study in college. Uh, well, Currently, I'm a marine science major, but um, when I first applied to colleges, I was really set on wanting to study neuroscience and be on a pre-med track. When looking into the programs and majors, one of the things that sort of made me gravitate towards Boston University was the fact that the tracks in the majors, if you look at every major that each college offers, they'll give you a list of sort of like what type of classes you'll be taking as Jimin explained. Um, and it, I realized it allowed me to not only get sort of that rounded education in neuroscience, but also explore other disciplinary areas with my pre-med track. Um, so that was one of the things that sort of were important to me when I was on my journey to pick a college. Great. Now moving on, speaking about tuition and financial aid, Ramon, we'll start. Hello again. So um, in terms of tuition and financial aid, that was uh, one of the most, if not the most important factor for me in choosing my college. And I know that it also is for many people. Um, I applied to many schools, but I knew that I would end up going to a school that gave me a good financial aid package. And BU is quite expensive in terms of tuition, but I did end up getting a um, generous financial aid package. And also during the pandemic, they were very helpful in terms of communicating and working with me, sort of paying my tuition. So that is one of the reasons I chose BU. Um, hi, <laughs> um, I'm a first gen student and my mother is a single parent. So I definitely can agree with Ramon when I say that financial aid was a very big factor in choosing my university. 
the main thing that made me gravitate towards BU was not only the generous um, financial aid package that I did end up getting, but um, it was also a, I think it's called need blind school. And um, when I was looking through universities, when I was applying, that was also something that I considered. And um, I don't know, um, should I go in depth in what that is, Michelle? Okay. Um, a need blind school is a university that looks at your, um, so we all fill out the FAFSA. The FAFSA sort of tells you what your estimated family contribution will be after you receive your financial aid package. Um, this is an estimate. This isn't a guaranteed number. Schools offer sort of fluctuate based on what they have available at the time with regards to like endowment. Um, regards to the fact, BU is a need blind school, which means that they essentially match that number. Um, don't quote me on that. I don't know if I'm explaining it properly, but um, from my memory, again, this was four years ago. That's what I remember. That sort of helped me make my decision to sort of apply to BU. I just wanted to add on to that. I believe BU still is need blind um, and many universities that are need blind will, will proudly advertise the fact that they are need blind um, because very few schools want to admit that they consider financials as part of the reason of enrollment. There are schools like that. It's not necessarily a, a bad thing. It's just something you want to consider. You know, do you feel comfortable uh, sharing your family's finances with the school? Uh, are you comfortable being judged that way uh, by the school? Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And moving on, speaking about location and studying abroad, Alexis. So I actually grew up in Hong Kong. And when the COVID like pandemic thing was, I was actually in Hong Kong at the time. And so this was like a year ago, exactly when I was a freshman, it's my first semester in college. And so at the time I was like really debating if I wanted to be taking classes at MIT and it would have all been virtual. At that time, MIT was allowing students on campus. And so I would have been like staying up all night pretty much because of the time zone difference. And so I actually spoke to some of the study abroad counselors here at MIT. And they were like, why don't you just try like doing a semester at your local university there as like a study abroad experience, kind of, but not, if that makes any sense. And so basically, my first semester, I was not actually at MIT. I was at a local university in Hong Kong, just like taking classes. And I got like, I was able to transfer all the credit that I earned there. So that all worked out pretty well. But I think that in terms of the, that, I thought that the office was really accommodating and they're pretty supportive in general if anyone has any ideas of places they want to go. So that was a really good experience to study about, I think. And in terms of like location in a more broad sense, I think the thing you should think about is whether you want to stay close to home or where you are right now, or if you want to try to explore somewhere new, because the big thing for me is I want to try living on the East Coast at some point in my life. So I thought this was a good place for me that. Yes, and to continue speaking on studying abroad, at MIT, we have this program called MISTI. It stands for MIT International Science and Technology Initiatives. And basically, they provide international opportunities, whether it be study abroad, international internships, or research opportunities. And there's they have their website where you can look up when applications are due and what countries and what programs they provide. So coming into MIT, I already knew that MISD existed and that I can take advantage of these programs. Um, so that was something you should also consider when trying to decide on a college because it's usually something you don't figure out until you come to a college and later find out that you have all these um, available opportunities for you. So if you know about it ahead of time, it could be a big factor when you're trying to decide which college you'd like to attend. All some super great points there. And next up will be food, beginning with Alexis. So food is like a big part of your college life, honestly. I don't think people stress this enough because you're gonna be eating at least like two or three meals a day while you're at college. And there's a lot of different ways you can go about that. You can cook for yourself, which some people do. You can eat at the dining hall, which I think most of the kids do, at least at our school. And it's just really a big part of your experience at whatever college you're going to. So at MIT, we have some dorms where you're allowed to cook for yourself. So you don't have to be on a dining plan. You can just go like to the grocery store, pick up your groceries and literally cook for yourself. And those dorms all have like kitchens, I think, that on each floor. So there's like a lot of space and like resources for you to do that. 
And I think that most of my friends I know who do that are pretty happy with their arrangement. You can always go into a dining hall and eat even if you don't have a meal plan, but you do have to pay for that, which I think is not as good of a deal as if you got it in bulk with a meal plan. So I'm personally on a meal plan because I think that the food's actually not bad. I think Jimmy might agree with me. This is a little bit of a controversial opinion at MIT because I think some students think the food's not that good, but I don't know if it's just because my standards are low, but I honestly think that it's pretty good. Um, the dessert especially is amazing. Uh, Jimmy and I are both eating way too much ice cream and cake every day, I think. So the quality is pretty good, to be honest. And I think that there's like some pretty flexible choices on like how many meals you want to purchase. There's like, you can go on the low end, like 60 meals a semester or like 190 or even more if you're an athlete and you want to eat like three times a day. So I think that it's pretty flexible and the food's not bad. And just being in Boston, in our area, there's a lot of like nice restaurants around here too, if you ever want to go out and get a change from the dining hall experience. I thought I clicked on mute. I apologize. Um, I am, I have celiacs. If I don't know if anybody knows. Um, basically, I can't eat gluten. Um, one of the things that I appreciate vastly about BU is the fact that they have um, specific sections in every dining hall that are for um, dietary people with dietary restrictions whether you're lactose intolerant or you have celiac disease or you keep kosher. Um, there are specific, I don't know how to explain it. It's like a vacuum tight room, like tree nuts, anything. Like anything you're allergic to will not be in this room. It will not um, affect you negatively. And I appreciate that because without it, um, a lot of universities don't have that believe it or not. So if you do have dietary restrictions, I highly recommend you look at the school's dining website to see what those accommodations are because you would be surprised. Also, BU's dessert is amazing. I personally am not allowed to eat it because again, gluten, but yeah, everyone loves the dessert here. Um, I don't wanna speak too much on the food but the dessert everyone loves the dessert so yeah that's fun <laughs> sorry yeah thank you guys so much and next up will be research and extracurriculars uh beginning with giselle this, this button's giving me a really hard time sorry um okay so one of the when I wanted to be a neuroscience major. Um, one of the things that was really important to me was being able to get research because without research you can't, well not you can't, but like it's difficult to get certain positions after you graduate. Anyways, um, one of the things that was really important to me is that BU has this thing called Europe. It's called the Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program. Um, and it essentially allows undergraduate students to sort of make their own research projects. You get funding, um, you get support from faculty. Um, it's a wonderful experience and it's fun. You get to basically do your own research project and write a paper. What's more fun than that? Um, also, as I switched my major, um, one of the things that was important to my marine science curriculum is the fact that um, we have this thing called the marine semester and you don't have to be a marine science student to actually do this. Um, but essentially we get to just work on a bunch of fun research projects and we go on a trip to Belize at the end so we can get field work experience. And I feel like that's something that was really important to me is sort of getting that experience in the field that I wanna essentially work in when I graduate. So that was important to me. Right, um, so I will speak about extracurriculars because I actually don't have a very strong research background, um, but uh, every school has sort of a wide range of clubs, uh, fraternities, sororities, Greek life, um, as well as like, you know, sports. Um, and it's important to consider, you know, do I actually like the sports team of uh, the school I'm applying to? Because that's a big one. Like if you, if you go to the school and you find out you actually hate their team, well, then you're going to have to cheer for them for the next four years. 
So, you know, that, that, that's something to focus on. Uh, oftentimes, you know, that, it's really a club for everyone. And if you uh, want to start your own club, it's doable. Uh, it's a lot of hard work um, trying to deal with uh, student affairs in terms of getting funding for your club is, uh, well, as Giselle would know, uh, a hassle. But, you know, if you're willing to put in the work, you can end up meeting some very interesting people at some very unusual clubs. Um, I'll say that even though I'm a first year dental student, I'm still in some of my undergraduate clubs. Um, now, it's a bit weird, I suppose, because I'm the only member who's you know, significantly older than the others. But you know, it's, still, it's still a good experience. You know, we still laugh. We still have a good time. So, you know, you form like these lifelong relationships sometimes with these clubs and especially uh, in clubs where the other people are from completely different majors. So you would never interact with these people except for in these clubs. Um, really quickly, don't mean to cut you off. Um, something also I wanted to mention that um, I didn't personally experience this, but I know it was an important factor to some people that ended up going here. Um, some sports teams, like extracurricular teams, what am I saying? Some division one sports teams will allow you to walk on their team. So it's interesting. Like you kind of try out like it's a club, but um, they give scholarships to students. And there are some universities who do this. I don't know of others, but I know BU does that. So if that's something that matters to you, um, definitely look into that. I think they're called walk on um, walk on something sports teams I'm sorry I don't play sports um, yeah anyways some really great information there thank you guys so much and Han Chao will now be speaking about essays right so for those of you applying to a school the essay is probably the most fundamental um, thing to consider when you're applying um, and you know, you, you can't, when, when you're applying for colleges, you know, the, the, there's always the recommendation you can make a generic essay about yourself because oftentimes these essays ask similar questions. Um, but don't be tempted in doing that. Every school really looks for something about themselves as well as you. So it's not just about you. Uh, and th this is something that they don't really share. Every school, you know, has sort of a kind of student they're looking for. You know, no matter how much they say, oh, you know, we want a wide, diverse range. There's, there's always some aspect that's core to that school's personality. And that's, that's the one thing you want to focus on. If that core is something you're not comfortable being with for the next four years, you know, probably this isn't the school for you. Uh, you know, case in point, BU is a research uh, university. It's actually one of the top research uh, universities in the country. So their emphasis is heavy on research. So if you absolutely despise research, you know, I mean, you can get by without doing research, but you might not be so happy in the school where almost all the professors are in lab all the time. Almost all the classes involve some kind of lab work and, you know, you'll be miserable. So, so that's something very important to consider. And also uh, the way your essay sort of explains your experience, you should have it supplement what that school's core uh, personality is so that you know, the essay makes sense. The school reads, I was like, oh, they've done their work. They know about us. We like them. They'll, they'll fit right in. And, you know, that will maximize your chance of getting in. Uh, I know a lot of people, they're motivated to, to apply to certain colleges because of prestige. Um, but I'll be upfront like this. I did not like uh, the campus at certain uh, schools north of BU. I won't name them. But, um, you know, I went there. I, I saw the campus and I was like, nope, uh, no way. I'm here for four years. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that's part of the reason why location is important. Uh, but the point I'm trying to emphasize here is if you don't express that properly in your essay, sometimes they'll read the essay and then they'll toss you out immediately because they're like, this kid doesn't understand what we're like. So uh, we're, not, we're not even going to bother looking at anything else. So the essay is critical. Yeah, sorry, did you want to add something, Giselle? No? Okay. Um, so... Moving on, Ramon will be speaking about AP credits. Okay, so for AP credits, I know I remember as a high schooler, which was only like two years ago, um, kind of deciding whether or not I should take AP classes, whether it was worth my time, because AP classes are essentially uh, college courses, which are taking like throughout the whole year rather than a semester. And um, you know, everybody was debating taking AP classes because you know they're more difficult you're going to have more work than a, a regular class or an honors class 
And then some people were concerned because, um, of course, some universities do not accept AP credits. So um, for BU, they are, I, I believe that they are very good with AP credits. Um, I took both AP Biology and, oh, I can't remember right now, AP Biology and AP Calculus. And um, for both, I received AP credits, which were, uh, which were able to be transferred to BU. So I did not have to take um, my intro biology class, which was called BI 107, but I did end up taking it just because uh, biology is my major and I did want the extra background. And, but I uh, do not have to take um, calculus one, which is required for my major. So it's good to have like that out of the way so I can like focus on exploring and taking other classes or getting some of my other requirements done for my major quicker. Yeah, some great points there as well. And next up, Han Shao will be speaking about how many colleges um, should you apply to? Right, and this is a somewhat dangerous topic to approach because it partially depends on your ability to apply to colleges. Um, and yes, there are college uh, application waivers available, which by the way, if you don't know about that, consult your, you know, uh, your local high school advisor about it. College waivers are a big thing, you know, um, because applications can be costly, you know, you apply to you know, six or seven schools and you can easily exceed a thousand dollars right there, you know, with just the common application and all the supplemental essays. And, and you, know, you also have to consider each college is a small investment um, when you apply. So if you do get in and you, you're particularly thinking about going, you know, there's the deposit, but even before then, there's all that traveling that you have to do. Uh, now, I know during the age of COVID, not, not everyone's sort of traveling uh, to campuses as much as they used to. Um, but if you apply to a school and you have absolutely no idea what they're like physically, you might find yourself in trouble when you get in and you might uh, dislike it intensely. Um, so, you know, I always say limit the number to a number you can handle, right? Now, most college advisors would say anything less than 10 is crazy because you're increasing the risk of not getting to any of the schools you apply to. Um, and some people say more than 20 is, is too many. You won't have enough time investing in each application. Uh, that being said, uh, I know some students who are very confident that they'll get into the schools that they want um, and they only applied to two schools and they got into both because they knew exactly what they were looking for in those schools. Uh, I will say that most people aren't like that. They, they don't actually know the schools as well as you know some of our friends did. Uh, so it really depends. Uh, one of the other key things I would also suggest when it comes to limiting uh, sort of your numbers also uh, just generally if you want to put that time in your senior year uh, time is a is a big factor you know each application takes hours to work on independently um, and if you're copying and pasting your your supplemental essays uh, that's a that's a very bad idea one of the easiest and, and most common ways that applications are rejected is simply they saw the application they're like wait this is addressed to the wrong school. They're like, oh, this kid copied and pasted. He's out. Like, we're not even going to bother. Um, and and that's, that's actually a very common mistake that's made all the time. You know, you're, you think you're applying to Stanford, but you wrote Dartmouth in the, in the, in the, in the email or the, or the, the application letter. Um, I confess I did that once myself. I sent an email to a school and I realized because I copied and pasted, I, I, I wrote a different school's name. And they're like, we're not that school. And I was like, well, I guess my application to the school is uh, over. Uh, they didn't say that outright, but I knew by then that th th this whole process was finished. Um, luckily, it was not really a school I, I really, like, really wanted to go to. Um, and and that, that's, a, that's another thing. Um, don't feel that you have to be 100% passionate about going to every single one school you apply to. It's good to be passionate about a few, but recognize that you have your limits. You know, like everyone wants to go to like an Ivy League school, but not everyone is, is at the caliber of getting into an Ivy League school you know for whatever reason um that's not saying that that nobody's uh, good enough to do so it's just those schools are looking for a very particular kind of student uh and you might just not fit that bill so it might be what uh, what people commonly call a reach you, know, you have to reach for it a little bit if you're lucky you'll get in if you're not lucky eh, well don't feel bad about it most other people didn't get in either okay so that was the last factor that we're going to be speaking about. So here are a few of the common questions um, that were submitted to our registration form. 
So the first one, any of our speakers can feel free to talk about this, but was diversity an important factor for you when choosing a college? Um, I'm gonna just jump right in. Um, I'm gonna say yes, because, um, well, I'm, I'm Caribbean, so I, I purposefully applied to colleges in cities because I'm from New York City and I knew I couldn't handle living, not necessarily the, diverse, the diversity of the school, but more the diversity of the, like, the location and the surrounding area. Um, I just wouldn't be able, I just don't see myself going to school in, let's say, Wisconsin. That's a perfect example. Um, you know, there, I have friends who they didn't want to stay in the States at all. They couldn't do it. So they went abroad. That's just something that they, you know what I mean? It's something to consider if it's important to your identity and sort of the way you, I don't know, navigate your surroundings. Um, it's not important in everyone, for everyone, but it was important to me. Yeah, thank you so much. And did anyone else want to add on to that or? Uh, sure, I could add on. Um, so I would say that diversity was an important factor for me. And I 100% agree with Giselle that um, going to a city school or a school in the city um, really does, I guess, check the check the box um, for diversity because um, there are just so many people of different backgrounds that you could meet, not only in the city, but of course, like um, BU itself is pretty diverse as well, so. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, just one thing that also was really, really made me be like, oh, this place is great. Um, the ratio between um, like domestic and international students um, I think BU is almost 50-50, and um, that was something important to me. I wanted to go to a school where I could meet people with cultural backgrounds different than my own, um, who could sort of give me, I guess, insight or like, I guess, a different perspective outside of the States. So. That's another really great point as well. Thank you so much. And the next question is for you guys personally, what was the most important factor to consider? Or if there wasn't one, if you wanna kind of talk about that. I mean, for me, I really focused on the sciences aspect of BU. Um, you know, the, although I, I decided to go into the career of dentistry fairly early on, it wasn't really until I'd been at BU for some time that I actually really feel the passion. Um, and so it, it was partly because of location, partly because of the people here. Um, that was the crucial factor. Uh, plus, I was on scholarship and, you know, since I was offered money, I was like, hey, the school offers me money, I'm coming. So that, that was a really big influencer. Most other schools were like, nah, we want you to come later. I was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I want, I want money. So, so that was part of the reason. I am broke. <laughs> so um, financial aid, that was definitely a big one, but not only that. Um, you know, because money at the end of the day, money isn't everything. Um, I guess the most, most, most important factor was the programs. Um, it was very important to me that I got a well-rounded education where not every class was like, then you're going to take this one, then you're going to take this one, then you're going to take this one. Um, BU has some flexibility with regards to like how you complete your major requirements, which is something that was important to me, like the most important thing, because again, um, you can, what's the point of saving money or like getting this nice financial aid package if you're not happy and you don't want to be there and you're not learning the things you want and you feel you need to learn? 
Yeah. I completely agree with that. Um, just to jump on. Um, so for me, I um during the or at the end of the application process, I guess, when I was deciding on a college to go to, I was in, in BU and this other school. And um I guess what really like made me choose BU was kind of just researching, um, hearing student stories and you know, seeing like what's really happening at the school, you know, if the students are happy, if they're enjoying their time at the school. And it seemed that like BU was a really welcoming and um, welcoming and just in, like, I'm gonna say, okay, yeah, it was a very welcoming school and it just seemed like the kind of place that I wanted to go to. Again, some really great points and things to consider there. And the last common question that we got is, are stereotypes of different colleges true? So speaking from your own personal experiences, would you think that stereotypes about your school or maybe other schools that you have experience with, um, are they true or are they completely just made up? So when I was planning at MIT, I was actually really scared because I didn't really fit what I thought was the MIT stereotype at the time. So I was really good at like, math Olympiad, science schools, you know, like really good at technology and all that stuff. I've always been more of like a well-rounded person. I really enjoy the humanities too. So I was like, I don't really know if this is the right school for me or if I got in, out if I'd even be able to handle all of it. And so when I came here, I was actually really surprised to find out that there's a lot of people who are just like me. And of course there are some like really, really smart kids who are amazing at like whatever it is that they do. But um, like Emily mentioned, you're all like really kind and willing to help you whenever you ask for anything. So I think that's really nice here. And also, I know you also have a stereotype where we're all like engineering or like technical majors, but we actually have a lot of students in like business and like marketing and all that cool stuff. And I think we actually have a lot of like students from like Wellesley and Harvard coming to take up business classes at some of business school. And I've actually taken one, it's been super fun so far. So I think that there's more to MIT than just like the technical aspect that makes people know about it. Yeah, I can also add to what Alexis is speaking about. I did not know about this earlier, like in the earlier ages of high school, but later I learned that MIT actually has a house concentration, which is humanities, arts, and social studies or social sciences. And that gives you an opportunity to deepen your understanding of issues or different methodologies in house fields. So that's not only STEM subjects that we are required to take or can only take. There's a lot of opportunities for us to take humanities classes or arts or enjoy our time in a different social studies class. And also, like Alexis mentioned, there's a lot of cross-registering um, opportunities available for you too. So you're not only limited to what MIT has to offer and also uh, students from other students, other campuses can also visit MIT for house classes or any techno technical classes as well. I just some really wanted... important things to think about things. Oh, sorry. I think I'm like, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say um, something that Han Chao mentioned earlier. Um, a college is not going to accept you if they don't feel that you belong there. And I think I really want to speak on this because I spent so much time with this sort of imposter syndrome where like, I was like, do I even deserve to be here? Like, I'm not as good or as smart as all these other people. And it's very easy to sort of put yourself in that box. But what you need to understand is that like, college is what you sort of, the experience you have is what you make of it. Um, the stereotypes, I don't feel like they're true because I feel like there's a niche and there's, a space for everyone and I feel like we all sort of belong together in a way like I don't think you would have I don't think they would have said oh yeah let's take this kid and just throw him to the sharks <laughs> you know what I mean so I, I promise you like no matter where you end up um you know as long as you try to just find your people find your group find your niche find that thing you like to study, um, it'll work out. And all those stereotypes, they're not true because it's what you make of it that matters. So. I should, uh, however, like to one 
add one little quick thing. This is slightly on a tangent, but this is about professors. Um, so here's the thing. Professors are people too, all right? They have families. Uh, they're often there they're, they're to do their own research. Uh, so you'll have some professors where, you know, to be honest, they're more there for the research than for the teaching, but like, you know, they're still teaching. Um, so don't forget that they're people. Um, and, and that's just like a key thing, I think, to remind yourself whenever you interact with professors. Um, so like if you speak to them like every five minutes, you know, just think, would you like to be like hounded by some young kid every five minutes? Chances are no. Uh, so don't do that. Uh, you know, the night before an exam, you don't understand something. You just frantically email them at like 1 a.m. Think, are you, well, I mean, you might be up at 1 a.m., but like most healthy human beings aren't really up that late unless, you know, they plan on going out or something. So, you know, chances are the professor is not going to email you back saying, you know, here's the answer. They're probably like, don't email me at 1 a.m. I'm like, you know, I, I can get up tomorrow morning. Um, and, and here's my biggest one, which I, I feel like uh, this is just generally good advice. Um, go to class. Like, yes, you are given the option not to go to some lectures because they don't take attendance like they do in high school. Um, but you'll fall behind um, if you try to self-regulate. And it, like some, some people are like really good at it. So that's fine. But like, you know, please go to class. The professors are lonely people, you know, they stand up in the pro DM, there's like no one there, you know, they're going to feel pretty bad about teaching and then I'd be very excited, you know, show up, you know, show, show, show some support, you know, you could sleep in, well, don't, don't sleep in class, that's like a very bad idea, um, you know, I mean, I, I guess certain professors are a little um, dreary, I suppose, but you'll, you'll learn to love them. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, just one last thing, please be nice to your, um, teaching fellows, I guess TAs, be nice to them. They have so much work, you guys, so much. Those poor grad students, man, they're, they're juggling. So just keep in mind, um, you are one of like 120 other people they need to help. So like they might not get back to your email immediately, but they normally do get back to you. And they're a great resource and they're great people, but they are people, you know what I mean? And they're not, they're students just like you. Like they don't have tenure. They're not doing like research for like the pay. <laughs> you know what I mean? So just be kind to your TFs. That's all. Yeah, a lot of super great advice there. So in terms of our speaker stories, I feel like they've all shared a lot about what went into choosing their college. Um, so we're going to keep this kind of short because we're running out of time and we want to have space for questions at the end. So if any other speakers just want to add kind of any last thing about their own experience, and then we will get into the Q&A. Yeah, okay, so. We are going to move into the Q&A now. So I have a few questions here um, that were submitted with the registration form, but you can also submit questions through the chat. Um, just type them in there and we will hopefully get to them all. So um, while you're all thinking of questions, I'm sure, um, we will start with a few submitted questions from the form. So, I'm not sure if any of our speakers have experience with this, but what should you look to, or sorry, look for when applying to a college's engineering program in particular? And is it mandatory to do any kind of research during high school to stand out? I don't know if anyone has any experience with that. I did no research in high school, none. And I go to a research university. Um, just be yourself. Um, interviews are awesome. If you can get an interview, please go. Go and do it. I know so many people who got interviews and didn't go, which I don't understand. I'm like, how do you, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, but no, you don't need research to stand out. Um, just, you know, focus on highlighting the extracurriculars and sort of activities and things that make you, you. 
And I promise that by being yourself, you'll stand out more because it's more genuine versus like, I don't know, joining a bunch of clubs you don't care about last minute and just slapping them on your resume. Um, yeah. So we've got a question from, oh, sorry. Are you right, I was just going to say, I, I noticed there was a question in the chat about early application, which I, I was going to speak about. So for those of you who don't see the chat, the question says, what are your thoughts on early application? Um, and here's the, here's the gamble with early application. You really should know what school you really, 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 really want to apply to if you're devoted into early application. And it, it, it should be slightly of a reach school. I, I, I qualify that statement because if it's too much of a reach, you're sort of wasting your early application opportunity. Um, you know, schools have deadlines. And if you, if you like wait till the deadline, that's not good because by then they probably already picked 60% of their pool. Uh, well, that's not necessarily true. It depends on how the school recruits. Uh, so some schools, they, they have what they call rolling admission, which means that when they accept you, they fill up a spot. And when they accept you, they fill up a spot. Some schools aren't like that. Some schools wait till everyone sends an application and then they say, these are the people we choose. Uh, everyone else, so sorry, we don't pick you unless someone decides not to come, then we might reach out to you on the wait list. But other than that, you know, they're not like early, rolling is both positive, it can have positive and negative impacts because the school fills up quickly, they're done very early. They, they won't look for anyone else unless someone drops out. Um, and so when, when you want to go to ap early application, another crucial aspect of it is whether or not when the school gets back to you in early application, which I be believe is mid-December, um, that's when the early application results come out. Um, you have what we call um, early decision uh, versus early action. Um, and those two are two slightly different concepts that are important. Early decision means you're definitely going to this school. You sign a, like some sort of paperwork that says, I'm going to the school next year. So if you get into a different school later in the application, it doesn't matter, you're going to this school. Um, and it's, it's a legal thing, like other schools will automatically withdraw their offers when they find out you've made early decision because you've signed the legal contract saying you're going to the school. Uh, early action, however, just says that I'm very much interested in going to school, but I'm keeping my options open. Um, and it's crucial because some schools might not be happy about the fact you, you went early action and be like, oh, okay, I guess you don't care about us that much. Or like, you know, well, why, why don't you want to come to us immediately? Um, and there are benefits to early application. I will say that for BU, I applied early application um, and I got in very early. I got in in December. Um, at that time, they were like, we offer you money. Please come to us. And I was like, okay. And that was sort of the end of my, my story. Um, I did get into other schools, but uh, they weren't as nice in their letters as mine was. Okay, so thanks for that super detailed answer there, Hancho. Um, another question from the chat. I'm not sure if any of our speakers have any experience with this, but um, if one was looking to get a sports scholarship or at least increase chances by playing sports, do y'all have any suggestions on requirements? Um, this person is very highly ranked in the state, but any other thoughts are welcome. I'm not sure if any of our speakers are in sports or not. I do not play sports, but what I do recommend you do is, I think I mentioned this, there are some sports teams that do walk on um, like, for example, the women's rowing team at Boston University, um, that's sort of a tryout process, and they do give you an academic scholarship for rowing at Boston University. It's, it's a nice chunk of change, I heard. Um, I don't know what sport you play, um, but I recommend reaching out to your coach and also to your college advisor um, that way they can sort of work together to sort of see how they could work that out for you. Um, another thing to do, message. You'd be surprised. Um, you could actually message people like on sports teams at different universities. And, you know, it won't be something like you could probably ask them for sort of guidance or like, oh, what was your process like? Because I don't know if any of us have experience, but I have had people reach out to me asking me, oh, 
you're a marine science major. Um, what is that like? How did you do your application process? What made you decide to go to this school? So um, that's happened to me before. Um, I don't think anyone would be bothered if you reached out to them. So maybe that might be something to consider. Yeah, so a great answer there as well. So yeah, um, Charles in the chat mentioned that you can also type um, your question in private to me if you're not comfortable having like your name out there with the question. Um, let's see, oh, another one here. Uh, my daughter is homeschooled, middle school still. I'm not sure how high school will go. Dyslexia has been a problem. Um, do any of you have any thoughts on going to college after homeschooling high school? So I'm not sure if any of you have any experience with that. So I can speak slightly to the um, concern regarding dyslexia. Um, most universities have, some universities, I shouldn't say most, some universities have great support. Um, BU has a very large sort of disability services department. And I would recommend if you're thinking about applying to those schools to re reach out and find out what services the school might provide to help you in that aspect. Um, as to the other concern, which is uh, homeschooling. Um, so homeschooling is becoming a more and more popular option these days and colleges are recognizing that. Um, you just have to be sure that you're meeting, first of all, you're meeting all the requirements that you get from high school. Um, and really the, the biggest transition, I suppose, and actually you're, you're kind of in a benefit here because if you're homeschooling, you're sort of self-regulating yourself. Um, so you'll actually have a little bit better control because you're, you know, when you go to college, you're self-regulating yourself. You know, you determine what time you get up, you know, when you go to class. Um, and as, as I mentioned, you know, I, I did say earlier, go to lecture. But if you're really one of those students that can't sit there and like pay attention to lecture, uh, then you know, by all means, don't 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 do that to yourself. You know, uh, totally, the the professors would be very happy to work with you. Um, to give you that extra support. Uh, I could say that in my, my program, there are almost 10 to 20% of students that have some uh, accommodations made for them for their exams, or that they get an extra half hour, or you know they get in a private room because it's too much to be sitting next to 120 people. Um, so the colleges understand, and they'll make the accommodations necessary. Uh, but make sure you know that the school you're applying to has those accommodations. Some schools do not, um, and they don't really have a good tolerance when it comes to that, especially large public universities. I would say large universities in general have, have more resources, uh, but the public ones, not, not too much because they, they prioritize their, their class sizes. So I would look at maybe private institutions. Just to jump in, um, I know socially, I did have a friend or I guess sort of a mentor since he is quite a few years older than me, who was homeschooled all like throughout his life, all throughout middle school, all throughout high school and going to college, of course, was an adjustment, but he did end up really enjoying his time socially. He did feel welcome where he was. So I think that um, there are many like different uh, groups, sort of clubs at college anything like you could join and you'll there's always a place for you to be welcome or to feel welcome yeah so those are all again really great answers um the next question i've got in the chat is i'm interested in electrical engineering and computer science how can i look up current research being done at mit so i don't know if our mit students know about that uh, yeah, so you can definitely look up different researches happening currently by going to the ECSMIT website, the CSAIL website, which stands for Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, the Media Lab, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of organizations across MIT um, providing what they're working on for research on their websites. And in addition, if you're interested in looking at potential undergraduate research opportunities, we also have a Europe program that stands for Undergraduate Research Opportunities, research opportunities Program. In that case, you can look up what are potential research areas that you might be able to be involved in once you are an undergraduate here at MIT. 
and especially in the field of EECS, there's a lot of available opportunities for you. Yeah, really great answer. And adding on to that, um, they said, how would you approach someone who is doing research in those areas if you're interested in working with them? Um, like you mentioned, we have like a your program kind of like what Giselle mentioned at BU. But here, like mostly with the professors and like existing research projects, and like support them in whatever is happening already in their research. And so I think Jimin also has done some research in the past, but how I reached out to professors is I would just see if I saw opportunities or something interesting and just email them to see if I could assist them with the research. And sometimes you'll hear no, sometimes you'll hear yes, and you just keep contacting professors until that happens. But we have like a Europe office here at MIT, which will help you also get in contact with professors who are looking for undergrads to assist with their research as well. So I think there's a pretty streamlined process if you're at MIT undergrad to get involved in more research. Yeah, some more really great things to consider. So it is almost 8.30, so we will no longer be answering questions from the uh, registration form. However, if you do have a question, please type it in the chat and we will try to get to it. We may run a few minutes late, um, but not by much. So if anyone has any last minute questions that they wanted to ask our speakers, um, type it in the chat now, even if you put it into the registration form, um, because we don't know who's here and who's not. So just give a couple of minutes for that. So if there are no other questions, I think that we can wrap up our webinar here for today. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to our speakers um, for volunteering your time and telling us about their own experiences. A recording of this webinar should be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, oh, and there's a question in the chat just quickly. If most of your extracurricular activities are academic and you do not do any sports, would this be a disadvantage? If anyone wants to quickly answer. Absolutely not. Um, I don't know if you're talking about high school or masters or what. Anyways, um, high school, I am clumsy. Um, I fractured my foot literally three days ago. Um, I did not play any sports ever at all. All my extracurriculars were academic and they ranged from working experiences to volunteer work two clubs. Um, I did not participate in sports and I don't think that made me a weaker applicant by any means. Um, once again, as long as you are passionate and you have sort of extracurricular activities that reflect your interests, um, schools will see that and that in and of itself will make you a strong applicant. Yeah, just to add on to what Giselle said, I actually did do some sports in high school. I played like soccer and like swimming for a little bit. But you know how there's like a limited amount of um, extra things you can add on your application to begin with? I actually didn't even mention that I played sports at all on my application because I didn't think it was as important to the other things that I was involved in at my school and like in my experience. And so I definitely wouldn't say that not participating in sports makes it so you don't need to it, like you saw mentioned. Yeah, so there's the answer to that question. And with that being said, you can follow us on our Instagram at Iridium Tutoring um, for the, kind of the latest updates. We will be having webinars in the future as well in the next couple of months. So stay tuned for that. Our website is also there, iridiumtutoring.org, um, where you can find out more about webinars, but also about our tutoring services. Um, we have tutors for a variety of subjects and grade levels. So if you're interested in that, there's that as well on our website. And last but not least, you can also join our Discord with that link. Um, yeah, so I think that is everything for today. And sorry, there's a fly around me, but um, yeah. So thank you all so much for coming. Thank you again to the speakers. And yeah, that's all we have for today. Thank you for having us. Yeah, no problem.